Hey everyone, uh, and welcome to Hey Summit's live weekly show. Uh, I'm Rob from Hey Summit, and today I'm pleased to introduce you to Uva Drysocker. Uh, Uva is the co-founder of Invoiceberry and has 15 years experience in the online business space. Uh, in this time, he started and scaled web projects and businesses in Germany and the UK within the B2B and B2C sectors. Uh, Uva's experience stretches from providing ad tech solutions, running an ad network, uh, publishing online games, establishing and scaling SaaS invoicing solutions, um, all which have won numerous awards. Um, he's also a passionate mentor advising startups from online marketing strategies to product development. Uh, today, we've, we've invited him to sh uh, onto the show to give us a bit of an insight as to what it truly takes to create the perfect remote life. And, and I'd love to also dig into uh, some of these uh, some of these strategies that he's um, displayed so well. So Uva, thank you so much for joining and, and welcome. Thanks a lot for inviting me, Rob. Cool. Um, so Uva also recently spoke at our Rethink uh, 2020 Summit back in August. And you had a talk called From Thoughts in the Shower to First Dollar, which was pretty popular uh, with our attendees. And you've got a pretty unique story about how and when you started out as an, as an entrepreneur. So could you kind of share that? Yeah, sure. So my journey started quite early, probably around 12, 14 years old, where I was, you know, just understanding how the internet works, doing some programming, uh, like self teaching myself, uh, all of that. And with 15 years, I stumbled up in some browser based online games. They were very minimalistic and I decided to also create one and I just taught myself like in a weekend or two, like how to do that, um, scratching my own itch, created like a game, everything on like free web hosting, free domain names, uh, like basically not spending any money because I was like 15 years at the time. I didn't have a credit card. I couldn't even purchase anything online. Um, and after I had a hundred beta users, I actually got someone interested to buy 50% of the game and to help me grow it. And that's sort of where my entrepreneurial journey started, where I basically picked a person who, so I was still going to school being 15 years old. I picked someone who was around about 10 years older than me um, to use as a safety guard. So he invested a tiny bit of money into it. And he also had to like cover all costs. If we make a loss, like for web hosting, for marketing or whatever, he would cover it. Otherwise we would split the money 50-50. And I remember even cycling with my dad and like shaking, asking him if he could please sign this contract because, you know, I was too young to sign the contract myself. Uh, so there were fun times. And that's basically how I grew like as an entrepreneur, like early on where I had this business partner. Once I sort of learned everything from him because he was a student and he had like a few small businesses. And once I felt like I outgrew that partnership, I uh, convinced him to sell his shares in the company to someone else who was another 10 years older than me. So this guy now um, was already divorced, second marriage, second kid, uh, bankruptcy, another company under his belt. So he he's done like a bunch of things in his life. And I felt I could learn a lot from him. Mm -hmm. And so that's how it then grew to a business that got us probably like five digits a month, like each of us just through like online advertisements. That was sort of the times where brands were pushing online early 2000s and like just companies would spend money like crazy on online advertisement, not understanding uh, return on investments, not, you know, not trying to actually make sense of anything, just pushing their brands online. So that was the perfect time for us. And we then moved from games to um, advertisement networks because we realized that those guys as middlemen would take a 50% cut on any profits. So any banner click, any banner view, um, they would take 50%. So we thought, hey, why don't we become a middleman for all these other games? And within like a year, we got like three, 400 games in the German speaking market to work with us. And, um, because we didn't know that we can buy in technology, we actually developed the ad server ourselves. And then we realized there's even more money in providing the technology to other 
advertisement companies than you know being the middleman. So that was like the next step. So basically, each project was building on top of the other project, and at some point, we ended up with you know like multiple projects within the company. We split the company. My partner went on to get. I think nine or 10 million euros in funding in the end. And um, I took the games. I went to the UK to have a very comfortable student life um, with like companies sort of running on like these games running on automation. And um, at some point I just, you know, it was enough. Um, I, I didn't reinvest the money into the games at that point. So that was a good lesson as an entrepreneur to always, you know, reinvest money. Um, into your business and not to just take it all out. But in the end, it was good. I sold off the games and I decided what's next and like software as a service. I just had um, read the book um, Getting Real by Jason Fried and DHH from Basecamp. And I saw, you know, software as a service that's very interesting. I don't want to cater for games anymore where you need like hundreds of thousands of players to make a profit. I don't want to cater for enterprise software. I want to be, you know, somewhere in the middle for like micro small businesses. That's sort of where my heart is. My parents uh, have a small business back in Germany. And I just decided, you know, like um, this is sort of what I'm looking for. And for my lifestyle, my idea of, you know, if I have a few hundred customers paying me $20, $30 a month, that's a comfortable life, uh, especially without wife and kids back then. And um, that's how I started Invoiceberry, mm. my current company. And, you know, like providing invoicing solutions to micro and small businesses. So, I mean, the, the way that you present it, I think is, 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 uh, is, is a little, little, little funny. You know, it's, it's, uh, we, uh, we started off with this because you, you liked, you liked it. I, I hear, I heard um, some, the, the fact that there were some constraints, you weren't old enough to be able to have a credit card, so you had to use free tools that were out there. But then every time you then made an advance or you you made a change, it was about like, you know, well, realizing this or kind of falling into this or 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 seeing that. Um, I imagine that that's quite a modest way of of of, uh, of articulating it, and that a lot of it was down to really understanding your customers um, and 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 trying to maybe you know, be obsessed uh, with them. So what, what, uh, what role did you just experimenting have versus you taking a lot more time in trying to understand the motivations of the people who are using your products? I think it's a mixture. So when we started off and that's the same with invoice Barry as worth, you know, over a decade to go with the games. Um, you know, you could, you, you have to collect some feedback, uh, you, you have to, you know, have some players or some, you know, businesses using your software. And, um, then it's a lot, you know, going back and forth, building the sort of community and, and like asking people for the feedback and it actually, people like to help you, you know, if you ask mm -hmm. them nicely, uh, people really like to help you. And I see that with invoice Barry, we, the company is now 10 years old and I still have customers emailing me to my personal email address because back then I did the customer service all by myself. Mm -hmm. And so they're there for like nine or 10 years already paying every month their subscription and using like every day, every week, you know, our invoicing software. And of course there's almost like a sort of friendship being built and like some feedback loop where I just randomly might send them a message. Hey, what do you think about this idea? What do you think about that idea? But there's also a lot of, because of my experience of like the last 15 years, there's a lot of just, I assume something, something and I just run the experiment. Mm -hmm. um, with the games, it was easier because they were generally for free and we made money on advertisement. So I can just decide whatever I want. You might, you know, annoy people but they're not paying for something, you know, with a monthly subscription service, you, you have to be a bit careful, but uh, there are a lot of experiments and micro experiences that you can like experiment, sorry, that you can run. And um, you can always revert back to the previous version if it doesn't work. So sure. I feel that's also very important 
nowadays to just, you know, rather than, and, and that's what I like about the SaaS um, sort of, you know, uh, product cycle where you just push an update and you can revert it rather than, you know, you have to ship like a new software, you have to download and update it on your PC. And, you know, it's just, it, it's not a smooth experience. It, it just yeah. takes a lot of time. And uh, these kind of micro experiments, it just seems like some of the consistency um, that you've talked about is staying lean throughout the whole process. Has that been, whether or not it's it's in the products that you build or in the experiments that you run, is that a guiding principle or um, or do you think differently about that depending on the business? I think it depends, but uh, for example, we now started offering um, a few months ago, client imports. So a new customer can, uh, who signs up to Invoiceberry can import the existing clients. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what is the fastest and best way to do that? And I calculated it would take us this much time to do and, and money to develop it like in a software way, or we just offer you a button to import your clients, you click it, you get some information and it just connects to our live chat and you basically just drop your CSV file or whatever format you want to send us your client information in, you just send it to us and we either manually or a developer imports it for you. And, you know, building this sort of uh, MVP just to see how many people will use it. And at the moment we have so little people, like so few people using it, where I don't even see a point building a Sure. a proper feature out of it. And that just yeah. saved us so much time because this version took us probably two hours to plan and execute. The other one would have taken us 10, 20 times that amount. And that's, you know, one of the sort of tests. And and, and then we said, hey, why, why does this happen? Then the next question is, why does this happen? Why is nobody interested in the client import? Because we sometimes got these, you know, customer support queries, um, hey, how can I import my clients? So then we changed our, in the onboarding process, our questionnaire, uh, sort of reflecting like questions like, you know, how many clients do you have? At what stage in your business are you right now? So this is then, you know, like the data collection to get some hard like data. Mm. And we realized, yeah, our customers tend to just, you know, start off their businesses, their very early stage. They actually, you know, if they have like five clients, they rather just do it themselves quickly. Mm. Interesting. So that kind of uh, like experimentation, sometimes the the assumption is you test something and then you need to make sure that it scales. But I guess that's a good example of you test something and the solution might actually not scale and that's okay because you still have it as an option. It's just people don't need to use it all the time or, or, or don't feel the need to use it all the time. Yeah, in, in, in the end, it's an experiment. And I mean, the definition of an experiment is it either fails or it doesn't fail. Sure. And I mean, this one, it didn't even fail. It just yeah. proved it saved time. that it's not needed. It. It, it saved us time and money, exactly. And yeah, now exactly. we can you know, use this developer time for, for other features on our roadmap. So it, it just makes sense you know, to, to run them. And I'm, I'm happy if you know, I have an assumption. And, and my assumption was people want this. Mm. Um, but clearly, you know, you, you can't always be right with your assumptions. And this is why you run the experiment. Totally, totally. Um, and so obviously from a, 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 you know, micro experiments or just experiments in general from a product development standpoint, um, it's pretty clear. But you also approach that with marketing experiments too. And I'd love to kind of dig into, into one example. Um, of your using, your combining, you know, um, advertising and uh, and content uh, generation, content creators, uh, and attracting them. I, yeah, I'd, I'd love to kind of learn about that as a little case study. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, so we're very heavy on content marketing at Invoiceberry. So we basically want to create amazing content for small businesses micro businesses, freelancers, people who are thinking of starting up their business because that's our target market. Mm. And we have hundreds of resources on our blog about that. So now we sort of, how can we scale this? I, I think one of our content writers was leaving, another one 
you know, grew into a different position of more like an editor rather than mm -hmm. a writer. And, and, and she's very busy uh, with editing this and doing some outreach. So I needed to find some new writers and I decided to rather than just, you know, go on Upwork or like any of the, you know, marketplaces to find writers to go into Facebook groups of digital nomads of, you know, copywriters and like probably five to 10 different Facebook groups. And mm -hmm. I posted a job ad there and I linked it to a Google form which was like a questionnaire about, you know, like just the general details, like giving a bit of a, like uh, to, to write like a bit of a sample text, uh, just, you know, the salary expectations and, and like, you know, standard questions basically. Mm -hmm. And I linked this up with Sapia, mm -hmm. the automation tool. And automatically after a few minutes, after filling out this form, they would get an email with further instructions like depending you know if they filled it all out so people basically it's sort of building a funnel to employ sure. people and um you know the first step is you know they read the facebook uh, post they you know say filled out all information into google form and then they get this email uh with further information and i'm already educating them a bit about different ways of writing content like giving them some guides about skyscraper technique about how to write good headlines and so on. So I'm actually giving them some value mm -hmm. in this process. And then uh, the task was to pitch me uh, three ideas. And that's the first time I actually personally got involved mm -hmm. in the communication with that person. So I already have them filled out all the information. I, I, you know, already provided them with an automated email and then I got um, their email and you know, judging from the email because I wanted them as content writers, but potentially as well to outreach to our partners, you know, to build partnerships. Sure. So it's very good to already see how they formulate their email. Are they just writing three topics or are they doing like a bit of a nice introduction? Are they just giving me three uh, blog post titles or are they, you know, the ones that I hired in the end, they gave me a blog post title, but they also wrote a paragraph of mm -hmm. one could be part of that blog post, what, you know, what could be the keywords and, you know, like just really varied, like from literally just, um, three blog post titles. And these people normally, I would just say, sorry, you know, it's not a fit, uh, and give them feedback about it, uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, they should elaborate a bit more and send away these people who use tools like Ahrefs or, you know, like, uh, Uber suggest to, to to do keyword research, to come up with good titles and so on. Mm -hmm. And those people are asked, okay, please write me a sample blog post. Mm -hmm. And so this again, like each email takes you probably less than 60 to 90 seconds um, to, to evaluate and sure. to, you know, like to reply. Um, so, so far the, the time investment is very slim, but, um, you get like a massive amount of people going through that funnel already at the top of the funnel. And then, uh, um, the next step is basically, I'm just waiting for the, um, sample blog post. Mm -hmm. We just gave them like a fixed sum. So each sample blog post gets paid as a uh, fixed sum. So, you know, there's no, um, I don't want to work for free, but there's also no, I charge 20 cents per word thing. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's it. It's like a sample. And obviously in the future, we agree on the, the rate. Uh, that's as well, if someone applies and let's say they want a dollar per word, I don't ask them for a sample because it wouldn't be fair. I'm not gonna yeah. pay you a dollar per word. And um, once the samples came in, we just put them into a Google Drive folder and my existing content team had to rank them. And basically anyone who got ranked like an eight out of 10 or above, I was then looking into it. So again, I, I didn't have to read like 50 plus, you know, uh, blog posts. I just read like the 10, 15 blog posts or mm -hmm. probably 10, um, that got rated like eight, eight and a half, nine, ten 10 out of 10. And, um, I had conversations with these people and we hired in one go, 10 content writers. We set up a system. We just used the help desk system, help ninja in our case, but you can use, mm -hmm. you know, like fresh test and any of these systems 
we have a specific uh, content writer email address where we reach out to them. We have a specific template. We want to write for this outlet. This might be our blog. This might be a partner's blog. We want this blog post. We want these keywords, uh, this amount of words, and that's it. And they get this template sent to them. You know, they give us back the work. We pay them. So it's a fairly, you know, automated, systemized, like, process. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess we're cutting like 80% of the time compared to last year when it was all, you know, manually by email and back and forth. And, and we have like now 10 voices on our blog rather than having, you know, one content writer, we, mm -hmm. we work with like a bunch of different voices, styles, and, and also, you know, price categories, depending, are we doing a guest post on, uh, you know, like a really high quality blog, or are we doing a guest post on a blog? That's not that important to us. You know, it's still nice to maybe build the backlink, but it's not worth it to spend like $300 on that piece of content. Sure. Sure. Fascinating. So because of that, how much did that then take to run that as an experiment? I guess that you didn't really know how this was going to work. And is that something then that you've used, you've continued to use clearly, I think, I guess it has, has been, but, um, you know, why did you think about doing it that way? Why were you, why were you thinking about articulating it that way uh, and creating that kind of a funnel for your marketing outreach? W were you, were there constraints that you were dealing with? Were you trying to make it as lean as possible or were there other things you were thinking about with the voices, for example? Hello? Oh. <laughs> Uva is, uh, we lost Uva. Oh, well, okay. Well, oh, you're back. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. You're back. Um, I, was just, I was just asking about um, the motivation as to why did you do that in the first place? So were you thinking, I don't have a big budget and I want to figure out a way of, of finding a whole bunch of writers very quickly? Or was there something, was there something else as to why you kind of maybe added your own constraints to that process? I think there's a mixture of things. So the one thing is I like running experiments mm -hmm. and I haven't hired in that process before. I've hired off Upwork and Facebook groups in the past and I didn't put my time as a constraint where I would literally anyone who applied and I thought they could be a good fit, I would send them my Calendly link and they would book a call and I would have like 10 calls. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in some calls you would realize after 30 seconds, it's not a good fit, but sort of, you know, out of courtesy, you're not just going to hang up. So you're going to wrap it up and it's going to be like at least 10 plus minutes. And so I realized I, I have to build a process and I, and I like building uh, SOPs around like all these sort of um, tasks. And so I built this SOP, which started with just having a Google form for all my jobs, where always the job ad, you can apply using like, you know, Upwork or whatever, but you always still have to fill out the Google form. And then I realized I can first automate that and I sort of challenge myself, how much can I automate it and how much information can I collect before I have to look at anything? Yeah. And this basically happened at the time when they pitched me uh, the blog post idea. And that's also the most interesting part of me, uh, of, of this whole experiment, because I realized content writers in the past that worked out really well were the ones that had a very good first email where they pitched mm -hmm. that idea because those content writers know how to formulate a nice email, how, how, how to just craft a nice email. And I think that's very important. And um, so that's actually, I, I think I ranked that higher than the actual blog content, mm -hmm. just how the email was. And I could say probably 10 out of 10 people I hired, they also crafted very good emails. Sure. Um, and, and and I think that's the reason why I did it that way. And and this way, I, I actually hired a bunch of people, like some people who get, you know, maybe five cents a word, but other people who get like 25 cents a word from, yeah. you know, 
English as a second language speakers to native English speakers who are US or UK based. So I have like a wide variety you know, of people. And to be honest, I have to say, um, sometimes the native English speakers are better, but sometimes as well, the non-native English speakers produce work just as good as the native English speakers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not entirely, you know, budget based, but of course it's a consideration. And especially if you want to hire a lot of people and one part of that was I realized we tend to have only like one or two voices on the block. And I wanted to mix it up a bit because I realized if you look at big blocks like HubSpot and HubSpot has, I mean, even multiple blocks within their brand, obviously they publish multiple times a day, but they also have so many different voices. And I think that's important. Like you wouldn't have an economist or like a newspaper with just like one journalist, you know, and, and, and that's sort of the thought process behind it. And we still have our blog editor who sort of tries to then bring it all together and like, you know, at least make it look, uh, you know, you know sort, uh, certain formatting styles, you know, have to be met and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess last question on this, uh, but are you, you know, you, you've built pretty, um, you know, well-performing businesses, they've done pretty well, but you've always stayed quite close to the customer and to the running of it. Do you think that that's, um, do you think being close to your business in that way has been one of the reasons why maybe you were able to focus on multiple things at once? I think it's good and bad to to do what I do because I really think I'm a bit too involved in a lot of times and sometimes it's hard to then uh, you know give away responsibilities and I'm doing tasks where I'm thinking hold on this is a task I shouldn't be doing I should have outsourced probably like outsourced or automated so, so there's my engineering background as well, where I, I like to automate things, you know, but, um, but I also like to over engineer. So, you know, coming back to this experiment with the client imports from earlier, that's like a, a big step for me to actually not engineer it, but to actually use other software and tools and to sort of just fake it. And, um, I think that's the same with like outsourcing tasks, uh, being so close to it, I feel that. I'm investing a lot of time and sometimes waste time um, being set close. And it could be invested at like, you know, w w when you look at your day and you look at like the $10, $50, $250 dollar task, mm -hmm. I could do a mixture of them. And I should technically focus on these $250 an hour tasks rather than the $10 an hour tasks. Exactly. Uh, it's something I'm still learning, but just because I'm a check of all trades and because I'm curious in everything, I just, sort of want to do it and I have to really, really struggle, let's say like web design. I'm really curious about it, but I know what a shitty taste I've got that I just gave up on it. And still every few years, I'm going to read like a tutorial about web design and color schemes. And I realize no, it's just not for me because I don't understand like what looks good and what looks bad. Yeah. But um, so, so I think it's their pros and cons like in everything mm -hmm. in life. but. I think especially now we're, we're going through this period of more customer research again, because we're trying to ship some bigger updates in InvoiceBerry. So I actually got um, back to really trying to jump on calls and like emails with customers. And I do realize that customers from a few years ago who know me when I used to do the customer support, they're way much more responsive. There's like mm -hmm. eight out of 10 nine out of 10 would respond to an email versus, you know, newer customers uh, from the last year or two or three say, you know, we maybe have like one out of two out of 10 responding, or we have to keep following up because, you know, they, they don't have this personal connection. So in a way it's good to always have like, you know, like a foot in the door with them and to at least have, you know, some sort of segment of your customers who know you a bit better and you can just jump in and, and ask them, you know, some difficult questions or you can ask them, Hey, uh, we have this new survey, but it's like a 15 minute survey, which nobody wants to fill out, but these customers, they invested in the companies, they invested in me. They're happy to, you know, 
fill out like a 15 minute survey. So happy to jump on a call uh, tomorrow morning for half an hour. And, and I think there's a lot of value in that as well. Totally. Interesting. That was, that was really enlightening. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Uber, for, for joining me today um, and for, for kind of just sharing some of your expertise and a very specific example, which I think is always fantastic to kind of dig into. Um, yeah, if anybody would like to connect with Uva, you can find him on the socials at uh, Uva Dreis uh, or connect on LinkedIn. Is that right? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Cool. And uh, to you, the listener or the viewer, uh, thank you for tuning in uh, to this week's live show, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we really do hope that you're staying safe and uh, see you next week. Thanks very much. Thanks, Uva. Thanks, man.